Coming up on Stu Does America, Adam Andrzejewski from OpenTheBooks.com is here with the most recent in Andrew Cuomo's corruption. There is no bottom. There is no bottom. And speaking of Cuomo, did you catch my op-ed in the New York Post? Uh, actually, it was today. Find it in the opinion section and proudly get yourself banned on Twitter for sharing it. I'll have a few more stories about the good governor to share later in the program as well. Thanks for subscribing to our YouTube channel to watch this stupid little show every night. Now's a great time to share it with your friends. Just tell them to head to YouTube and search my name, Stu. I'll be the first one there. And I put up a new Conserva Nerd update on our podcast channel. The latest in breaking polls here as we get close to the election. If you're not subscribed yet, you're missing out on exclusive content that nobody else gets. So what are you waiting for? Go subscribe, rate, and review. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. And finally, there is still time to take advantage of Blaze TV's huge new deal. Just head to blazetv.com slash stew. Enter the promo code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And you'll save 30 bucks off a Blaze TV subscription. Offer expires after Election Day. As I mentioned before, I have a new Andrew Cuomo op-ed in the New York Post. But since it's a negative accounting of a Democratic politician, it's only a matter of time before Twitter starts banning people who share it. Don't you want to be one of those people? I know I do. Let's do Big Tech Censorship. Conservatives sort of have a good reason to not trust the media. It's built on a a foundation of a lot of long-term observation and experience. Uh, And look, we did a show, I think it was eh, maybe a month or two ago, about Joe Biden. And this show talked about how Joe Biden eulogized a KKK member and how, I don't know, maybe somebody should notice that. Well, let me give you a quick example of the way the media works. Uh, This is the fact check from the Associated Press on the fact that Joe Biden eulogized a KKK member. What they did, instead of taking, like, let's say, my show, meticulously researched program, uh, and fact checking that, what they did instead was to find a Facebook rumor that was going around, one of these forwards that was going around Facebook, and fact check that. And what they found was, do we have the tweet uh, here? Uh, Fact check seriously. Uh, is Robert Byrd was actually an exalted cyclops of the KKK, not a grand wizard. I have the article right here. The uh, AP's assessment, partly false. Biden did eulogize Senator, Senator Robert C. Byrd when he died, but Byrd was not a grand wizard in the Ku Klux Klan. He was a member of the KKK in the early 1940s, but later renounced his affiliation with the hate group. And they go on to say the post is misleading. Byrd never held the post of Grand Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, a top leadership role, though he was a member of the organization. As a young man in West Virginia, Byrd recruited members to local KKK chapters and was elected to the post of Exalted Cyclops, according to his own 2005 autobiography. Is that a good point? I'm sorry. Exalted Cyclops, Grand Wizard, I guess... I honestly don't know because I'm not in the KKK, nor do I ever care to learn enough about the KKK to understand its management culture and structure. But really, exalted Cyclops, kind of enough for me. Being in the organization, kind of enough for me. And let's, he wasn't just in the organization. He actually recruited people who were out of the organization to come into the organization. And his racism didn't stop when he left the KKK, as we covered in that show. Maybe we can go back and uh, link that in the show notes or something today. Um, that's just a, one of a million examples as to why the conservative populace does not trust the media. So... This thing called social media comes along. It's not surprising that conservatives would want to jump on board that one. I mean, it sounds pretty great, right? We get to influence the way things go. We don't, you know, we're 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 taken out of mainstream media. You take all these people who would like who are conservative and would like to be journalists and you don't allow them to work in any mainstream organizations. Well, they're going to go start their own and they're going to go on social media and they're going to get the word out that way. People care about these things enough to go out and create new pathways to get the information out. That's America. That's great. That's a good thing. But it's, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult online. It's becoming almost impossible if you're conservative to get your point of view out there. 
Uh, here is Ted Cruz talking to uh, Jack Dorsey. Of course, he is the ultra long bearded uh, CEO head of Twitter. Here he is. Mr. Dorsey, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? No. You don't believe Twitter has any ability to influence elections? No, we are one part of a broad spectrum of communication channels that people have. So you're testifying to this committee right now that, that, that Twitter, when it silences people, when it censors people, when it blocks political speech, that has no impact on elections? People, people have choice of other communication channels with which... Not if, not if they don't hear information. If you don't think you have the power to influence elections, why do you block anything? Hmm. Uh, well, we have policies that are focused on making sure that more voices on the platform are possible. We see a lot of abuse and harassment, which ends up silencing people and having them leave from the platform. All right, Mr. Dorsey, I find your opening questions, your opening answers absurd on their face. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, Ted Cruz is pretty good in these environments. I, you know, these tech CEOs, I have some sympathy for in that they are getting hit by the right so to not censor anybody. And we have to remember, they're getting hit by all their buddies on the left saying they should censor everybody. They are kind of in the middle of this thing, though I don't understand why they go down this road of trying to pick winners and losers. Just let it fly, man. You know, come up with other tools to make the platform better. But taking people's commentary off the site just isn't going to is, you're putting yourself in an impossible position by doing it that way. And we're seeing here. Now, Twitter going after places like the New York Post. The New York Post has all sorts of different information, has all sorts of news stories, has some liberal commentary, has some conservative commentary, has all sorts of things, including an incredible op-ed about Andrew Cuomo. Did I tell you about that? It's up there now. You should go uh, retweet it. But you know who can't retweet it? The New York Post. Sure, it's in their publication on newsstands today. If you can get a newspaper, it's going to be in the printed edition. If you want to go on the website, you can find it right there. It's in there, but they can't tweet it. Why? They don't have access to their own freaking Twitter account. This is the fourth or fifth largest newspaper in America. And we are four days in front of a presidential election, and they don't have access to their own Twitter account. It seems incredibly strange to me. It seems incredibly uh, strange to Sora Amari as well. And he, uh, he tweeted this. LOL, I commissioned, edited, and paginated this piece. Definitely, I did not have to look up the word paginated. Yet Twitter forces me to click three different buttons to retweet it. Twitter has Cuomo's back. He's retweeting uh, my piece from the New York Post as helpfully, thank you very much, Josh, helpfully retweeted by Josh Hammer. Um, it's an interesting thing here. Why? I mean, we're talking about the people responsible for the material. They can't even tweet their own pieces? I'm surprised they allowed me to do it today, to be frank, to be frank about it. But it is up at Stu Does America uh, pinned. Uh, Jake Tapper kind of took this on a little bit. And Jake had, uh, he was able to at least get some answers here. Uh, he tweeted this, uh, since Twitter has locked out the New York Post for violating rules that no longer stand as rules, but Twitter won't revisit past enforcement decisions, the New York Post could end the standoff by deleting the tweets that broke the rules, thus unlocking its account, and then tweet them out again. Before we go on to the next tweet, think, think about what this is here. The Post didn't do anything wrong, right? They actually were in the right. They were getting um, their page blocked and their account blocked because they were tweeting an absolutely legitimate op-ed that has seemingly been verified in several different ways since. Now, we don't know all the information yet. That's because mainstream media is not going after it. They're, they're not pursuing the truth with a Hunter Biden story, which is really frustrating. But let's just say they had this rule before, which was they were going to block links to any story that had uh, hacked materials or stolen materials. Now, there's no evidence that the New York Times acquired this material that way. In fact, they were very clear about how they, were, they acquired it. And, you know, if you believe their story, it's legal. Uh, it's a very strange story. But, you know, when you're dealing with a guy who's smoking crack off of hookers' bellies, you know, sometimes weird things happen. It's kind of it's kind of the Hunter Biden guarantee. So they get their Twitter account blocked and they want to keep tweeting these stories. Uh, but they they can't. They can't. So Twitter blocks them and then says, look, if you delete these stories because you violated our rules, we'll let you have access to your account again. And the New York Post is taking a stand here and they're saying, look, we're not going to delete legitimate stories. So you give us access to our own freaking account. 
This is this is ridiculous. The t- the, the post was so beat up for or excuse me, the Twitter was so beat up by their treatment of the post that they changed their rules. Twitter changed their rules and they said, OK, we're not going to block accounts anymore. Or we're not going to block those links anymore. Yet they still are forcing the post to go in and delete these tweets in some bizarre fashion to, I don't know, prove fealty to the former rules that don't even apply anymore. As Tapper goes on, he says, I asked a Twitter executive if this was possible, um, retweet, uh, deleting the tweets and then retweeting them so they'd all still be out there. He said yes, and it would end the whole thing, probably take 15 seconds. And yes, Twitter could end this immediately as well, given that these rules are no longer rules. I'm just suggesting this is a possible way to end this, and I guess that's true. Uh, he goes on, he started getting some pushback on his tweets. Since the usual bad faith actors are now depicting the, me, this as me telling the New York Post to bow to Twitter to delete the tweets, I'm clearly not say, stating that. I'm saying they can delete them and then tweet them out again. I agree Twitter enforcing defunct rules makes no sense. Zero. I also I also don't think Twitter should have blocked them to begin with, but this would be a way for New York Post to have cake and eat it too and get its Twitter feed back. Just an idea. Don't like it. That's fine too. So again, this turn blows up into this big thing when Twitter puts itself in this position. A very easy thing to do for Twitter is to take legitimate, obvious, huge media organizations like the New York Post, to take public officials like the president, like other officials. They banned, you know, some one of these guys that was tweeting about uh, the border, uh, a government official tweeting about the border. They banned that for hate, even though he didn't tweet anything, any hatred at all uh, in his in his actual messages. The point is, though, Twitter has decided that it should be an arbiter of these things. Twitter has bought into this idea that they should be telling us what is good and what is bad, what is harmful, what is not. And while that is, I think, their right to do on their own service, uh, it is still, it's something, once you get involved in that world, you're never going to be able to solve this correctly. You know, I, I, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times we talk about legislation and regulation and, and that stuff. There might be something you can do around the edges. Mike Lee talked about some of this uh, the other day on the radio show. But at the end of the day, we're never going to be happy with how a Twitter executive manages this process. It's never going to be an appropriate uh, response for us. Conservatives always lose when there's more editing being done by these services. It's never going to be something that turns out, you know what, this guy, he really did a good job. He knows exactly what to edit and what not to. I mean, think of whoever you think would be the perfect person to be running Twitter in this way. Even that person, I'm sure you'd have a problem with eventually. I mean, you know, I guess unless it was me, because I'd make all the right decisions. We all know that. I I just think that there is a basic line, right? A basic line where these companies could make sensible decisions. Get rid of, uh, you know, child porn and threatening messages. And there is an understandable line that you should not have to deal with on these services. But when you're talking about political points of view, uh, it's just wrong. Uh, you know, we have this, uh, we, I, I talked about this on, on the radio show earlier today. A woman who wrote a book about um, uh, her, it was about how teens should not have, or should think carefully about having sex changes. Uh, becoming a transgendered teen is something you should do uh, with caution and isn't right for everybody. That's basically the message of the book. Again, it doesn't say don't do it. It doesn't say it should be illegal even for teenagers to do. It just says we should we should just do this higgledy piggledy, as Glenn would say. So she has been uh, and her book have been, uh, you know, throttled by Amazon. They can't advertise it, but you can advertise the opposing point of view. It's been throttled by the social networks. It's uh, people try to put up billboards and get a GoFundMe to put up billboards for the book. GoFundMe ban them. It's time after time after time. This is censorship. It is something that is a major problem in our country. And while I hate the government getting involved in anything, it should be solved somehow. Uh, I don't like the idea of of the government stepping in and saying, uh, you know, these things should be edited largely, I mean, selfishly, because conservatives never win these scenarios. It's not something we'll, we will win uh, doing. All these people are on the left anyway. They're going to censor it. You know, we're going to have very little recourse. Giving them more tools uh, is not a good idea. But they these sites already have the ways to make Twitter easier. And this is a key thing because it's really a progressive concern. Twitter has tools where you could have a list 
to block a certain uh, type, a certain amount of people. Like if we, if we were to say like the Stu does America blocked persons list and I blocked, I don't know, uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. And I gave th- this whole list. and You could just click one click would block and take all of my recommendations and block all these people. That feature actually exists on a lot of these social networks, but it's not easy to use. There's no real way to curate it. It's, it they, don't, they don't promote it very widely. You could block different topics. You could block different comments, words, all of these things. And, and you can do all these things. They're just difficult to do. Making those tools easier is an easy way to make the user experience easier. One of the things Twitter, I think, legitimately uh, makes a point on, and so do Facebook and Instagram and all these things, is like we joke about it all the time, but Twitter's a hellscape. It's not a positive place. I don't like it when I go there. Uh, when you go on Twitter, you wind up getting, you know, all you're doing is seeing fights and insults and ugly comments. And every once in a while, there's this positive thing. And you're like, wow, that's what Twitter should be. But it's not. It's a hellscape. And so it's a negative part of a lot of people's lives. It's one that I know without this job, I wouldn't be experiencing. I wouldn't be on it at all. I would never go on ever because it's I don't like it. I don't like it. But, you know, it's part of our world. And luckily, it's a way, at this point at least, to get out things that I hope you are interested in and get our message out a little bit. Uh, So you use it because you kind of have to. But in reality, it's not a positive user experience many, many times. So you could make the the user experience easier and better for the person uh, utilizing Twitter with features they already have. The problem is what they want to do is not to make the user experience better. It's to control those users who want the wrong thing. If you are a consumer and you want to have a, uh, you know, something like you want to b- talk about the, this book that we just discussed, where uh, you know, maybe, maybe flipping genders as a teenager maybe not a great idea. If you have that view, well, they think that view is damaging. They're not saying that you, you know, there are definitely liberals out there that don't want to read that view, and they could easily block that view. The problem is, these tech companies don't want you to be able to consume that view. That's a totally different standard. You know, they want to be able to stop those things from being available to you, not to make your experience better. And that is the real problem here. Um, you know, to show how bad this double standard is, Tim Pool has a great tweet. Now, remember, we're talking about the New York Post, who's, who wrote a, a story about Hunter Biden. Um, and some liberals have said, well, it's not verified. First of all, can someone try to verify it then? I know a lot of people on the right have tried to verify it and successfully have verified many parts of it. Where is the New York Times? Where is uh, the, the Washington Post? Where is a left wing newspaper to come in here and, and, I don't know, ask Rudy Giuliani for the hard drive? Interview Tony Bobolinsky. Interview him. Bring him in there. Maybe poke holes in his story if you can. I'd like to see that. I would actually like to see that. I'd like to know if this is real or not. But they don't do that. But they'll let other things fly. Tim Poole brings up this example. He says, we can't verify the emails from Hunter's laptop that were corroborated by a witness on the emails and verified by forensic analysis and are not part of a Russian disinfo campaign, even though we have no evidence to suggest that it is. That's why we can't cover the news. Also, this from the Huffington Post a couple of years ago, listened to, I've forgotten about this story. They let this slide. A tape might exist of Trump doing something in an elevator. That is how the tweet begins, though exactly where that somewhere is and what that something might be. No one in the media can say that's because no one in the media seems to have seen the tape or is even confident that it exists. That's a story that was not blocked. Donald Trump might have been in an elevator somewhere is legitimately the beginning and end of the story. And that was fine to go. You understand why conservatives get pissed off. You're, you know, these companies are drawing, drawing the criticism, drawing the potential regulations because of the way they act. Part of this, though, is, is on us. And, you know, we can sit here and complain about how Twitter treats us. We can complain how social networks treat us. And we could say, look, we have to do these things. We have to complain about them. Why? Because they control the political discourse in this country. Why is a question that needs to be asked. Why do they control the political discourse in this country? Who gave them that control? 
A lot of social networks have started. You know, Friendster had a social network, too. They don't control it. Why does Twitter control it? Why does, uh, why does Facebook control the political discourse in this country? Why? Because we gave them control. At no point do I remember having a conversation where we all sat down around the kitchen table and said, you know what, let's give, let's say, six, eight hours a day to these stupid apps. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens with the human experience if we take one third of our lives and about half of our waking hours and hand them over to these three companies. I, maybe it'll work. We never even talked about that. It just happened to us because we willingly went on these, on these services. A deeper problem here is figuring out at what point we can reverse this and how do we reverse it? Because being dependent on companies like this is a bad thing for political discourse. It sometimes does get blown out of proportion, too. Um, let me give you a couple stats here. This is from uh, Pew Research. We lose sense sometimes as to w the process here because Twitter does have a big impact on our political discourse in this country. But look at this. This is a, um, a, a large majority of tweets come from a small majority of tweeters. The top 10% of tweeters provide 80% of all tweets on Twitter. The, the top 10% provide 80%. The bottom 90% of tweeters uh, are only providing 20% of the tweets. In other words, there's a bunch of people on Twitter, right, that are there and not really tweeting. Maybe they read it occasionally. It's basically a bunch of loud mouths at the top, like me. Then you've got this. We talk about the political discourse in this country. There's only 22% of Americans are on Twitter. Only a quarter are on Twitter. Of the people who are on Twitter... The bottom, uh, the people who don't tweet that much, only 13% of those people have tweeted about politics in the last 30 days. And of the big time tweeters, only 42% have tweeted about politics in the last 30 days. It's something like 3% of Americans are tweeting about politics once a month. Okay? This is not the end all be all of our, pol of our political system. Let me give you one more here. Flip, 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 flip. I flip through the story. I printed too many. Here we go. Median tweets per month. The top tweeters tweet about four times a day, 138 times a month. The bottom 90% of tweeters, two tweets per month. People are just not even using the service all this much. But what happens is the people who are on it, those top tweeters, you know who they are? Every single freaking person in the media. Media, politicians, celebrities, influencers, all those people who wind up going and reacting to the people on Twitter. And that's how they shape the coverage in every other arena of the media. That connection should stop. People should stop worrying about how many times they get retweeted. Watch the social. Uh, what was it? The social uh, experiment. What the Netflix documentary. We talked about it a few weeks ago. Social dilemma. Thank you. The Social Dilemma, watch it. These, these products are specifically designed to keep your attention, to have you coming back, to gamify your speech. And they want you to come back and get retweets and likes and all that other stuff, followers. And so this little tiny segment of our population feeds among itself. And then these, these people on Twitter, these reporters, go back to their mainstream media uh, uh, publications and they push all this stuff out because they're convinced everybody believes it. I just got 5,000 likes on Twitter. Well, this is an insane way to run a civilization. And hopefully we can get this under control. And I don't know, put things in freaking perspective. Because the way we're going right now is not a way that actually works. Let me tell you about something that actually does work. Having a real estate agent you can trust. If you want to sell your home, you need one. You can't be going. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to go down. Uh, I'm going to drive down the street. And uh, there's, a, this, there's this little bus bench there. There's a bunch of homeless people usually sleeping on it. But every once in a while they get up. And you know what's there? A loving, caring face of a real estate agent telling me that they're the best in the whole universe. I'm going to use that information to make a phone call and get my real estate agent. Doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make any sense. You have to go to a place where they actually have screened the real estate agent so you can know that you can trust them. It's not about advertising. It's about getting someone who does the job well, who gets the best price for your home, gets you the best price if you're buying a home, someone you can trust to help fix it up, get good people there, someone who knows how to show a home. All of those elements that go into it, get the best people. 
realestateagentsitrust.com has done all the work for you. Go there now, realestateagentsitrust.com. If you need someone to help you buy or sell a home for the best prices, go to uh, realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. Welcome to Adam Andrzejewski. He's the CEO and founder of OpenTheBooks.com and has been covering our favorite governor, Andrew Cuomo, and his corruption, both in his COVID response and his political campaigning. Adam, welcome to the program. Great to be on the program, Stu. Thank you very much for your interest in our work. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your organization before we get started. OpenTheBooks.com. What do you guys do? So our mission, simply summarized, is every dime online in real time. Last year, our auditors filed 41,000 Freedom of Information Act requests, and we captured virtually every single public employee salary and pension record at every level of government across the entire country. We also captured state checkbooks, and that leads us to the latest investigation on New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> That's a gr- I love that because, I mean, honestly, you just can't. You can't it has to be in real time. Because it, these things happen, they go through two years, uh, and then we don't realize any of these scandals are going on until long after the money's already spent somewhere else. Uh, can you give me a little well, bit of the details of, of, of what you found with Andrew Cuomo? Right. Citizens need to be able to follow the money, and especially in the state of New York, because the state of New York has weak ethics laws, and Cuomo's driving a bus through those weak laws. We matched the state checkbook up with Andrew Cuomo's campaign donor disclosures, and here's what we found. We found the governor engaged in the highly unethical practice of soliciting state vendors for campaign cash. He solicited 347 vendors, collected $6.2 million of campaign donations, and those vendors reaped $7 billion out of the state checkbook since 2014. So Cuomo gets campaign cash, and then... Magically, uh, we have this money. We have state dollars being spent uh, with these particular vendors. Is it, is it always in that order? Is it is it that is it that clear, or is it something we're kind of speculating on? Well, sometimes it is that clear, but quite frankly, you know, we're based in Illinois. It is the Super Bowl of corruption. Even in Illinois, we have pay-to-play laws. So I don't care what order it comes in. Sometimes the state contract comes first, campaign donation is recycled in from that state money, and sometimes it's the standard, it's the traditional pay to play, where you give campaign cash and you expect a state contract. Uh, You you use the word soliciting. So when you use the word soliciting, what does that mean? Is this he going out there and actively getting, like he's asking for all of these donations, or is this the type of thing where the defense might be, look, you know, we just happen to align with the governor's values and that's where we're giving our money. Well, actually, the governor responded on this. He says he doesn't control any state contracts. He exerts no influence. (laughs) And any politician where even one dollar of campaign cash would influence a decision doesn't deserve to be in the public square. Look, it's laughable when you have 300 and 47 companies, and I don't care if they're big four accounting firms, the biggest law firms in the state, you know, basically utilities, the telcos, the cable companies, your biggest banks like Citibank and and Bank of America, uh, in addition to the very powerful healthcare associations, when these huge companies are kicking back part of their state contracts and state payments to the governor in the form of campaign contracts, that is a legalized money recycling machine and the governor is playing it for all it's worth. Mm. How does this tie into his coronavirus response, which I believe is the worst in the world? Um, He has had all sorts of problems with these uh, medical facilities. And it does seem like your work has identified some some uh, question marks here around his treatment of these medical facilities. Absolutely. So in in March, on March 25th, he issues the executive order to take the COVID positive seniors from the hospitals and put them back into New York's nursing homes. We tracked the flow of funds behind that executive order. That executive order was put forward and advocated by the Greater New York Hospital Association. Who are they? In 2018, for Cuomo's reelection, they put a million dollars into the state Democratic Party, which funded Cuomo's reelection in 2018 for governor. You remember when Cuomo, at the end of 2019, booted $1.4 
billion dollars worth of Medicaid payments into the next fiscal year, where he appointed a commission. Who co-chaired the commission? The head of the association and, the, and their partner, SCIU, the union. Six weeks before they're nominated to co-chair that commission, they kick them another $20,000 worth of campaign cash. In 2018, the association and SCIU, the union, collectively, they spent $6 million lobbying in Albany on behalf of the governor. So then the, you know, thousands of seniors die in the nursing home. And what does the association do? They run statewide advertising, touting the safetyness of the hospitals and promoting Andrew Cuomo, the governor. I mean, how, you mentioned that there's loose laws in New York. How on earth can this be legal? I mean, you're talking about a government official who is using, he's taking money from these organizations, he's using them to get himself propaganda all over the television. And I've wondered over and over again, how on earth can Andrew Cuomo have a 60 and 70 percent approval rating in this state when what he's done has been clearly catastrophic uh, in this situation? This has well, got to be part stop, of it. He likes to operate in secret. That million dollars from the, the, health, the hospital association that funded the Democratic Party that helped him get reelected, that was done under a secret donation. It stayed secret till about six days before the campaign ended. Uh, furthermore, Cuomo, as you know, he won't release the number of nursing home deaths. And this led on Tuesday this week to the Department of Justice opening an investigation to try to get to the bottom of it. I think he's the only state in the entire country that won't release the numbers on the deaths in the nursing homes. So this is a guy that likes to have his policies cloaked in darkness. Mm, that's true. And they are the only state in the union that's doing that. To the They go to the extent of what the information they do put up there. They put it in a very difficult to use PDF that you can't manage. Where like Florida lists every single case. They're not trying to hide anything. They've got every single case listed. It's very easy to go through. They give you almost too much information. You know, New York is the exact opposite. And they are trying to hide this. And we have thousands of families who've lost a loved one that are trying to deal with this and to see that you know there's money involved is the least surprising thing i've ever heard because it's andrew cuomo the guy's always out for himself he's out for personal enrichment he's out for additional power and the fact that you guys are on this and finding it uh this prevalent is really disturbing well, thank you very much. We've seen where there is a gray area in New York law, Andrew Cuomo drives a bus through it when it comes to uh, raising campaign funds. As you well know, Stu, uh, the state legislature, because of the abuses from Andrew Cuomo in January of 2019, they closed what was called the LLC loophole. It allowed LLCs to give up to $64,000 of campaign money where regular corporations were cashed at capped at 5000 Andrew Cuomo raised almost $13 million since 2014 on that loophole, forcing the legislature to close it. No, oh, unbelievable. Um, if people want to look into this and, and see, I know you wrote a piece, uh, was it Forbes, I believe, that kind of outlined all of this. Uh, there was a story about it in the New York Post as well. Where can people get all the information? Just come to OpenTheBooks.com. We've got everything. The New York Post, we broke it with Miranda Devine, a great full page on Monday, on last Monday in the newspaper. Uh, then the whole 2100-word report is published at Forbes. We have links to both of them on our website at OpenTheBooks.com. All right, Adam Angievsky, CEO and founder of OpenTheBooks.com, doing a lot of hard work to make sure people like Andrew Cuomo are actually held responsible for their actions. Adam, thanks for coming on the program. Stu, thank you very much. All right, back in a second. Speaking of Andrew Cuomo, I ask you, Lord, to please help me for this. Let me get through this segment without losing my mind. Andrew Cuomo went on The View to lie. Everyone who is on The View with Andrew Cuomo is too dumb to know he's lying. So they can't possibly ask him any decent follow-up questions to any of the topics that were brought up. One of the things, uh, let me give you a couple of these. Oh my God. There's been a lot of confusion about an alleged March 25th order directed at nursing homes uh, to accept in New York COVID infected patients, possibly leading to the death of more than 6,000 seniors. Now you say in your book, this is a question by the way, 
a lot of confusion about the order, guys. There was a lot of confusion about it. You say in your book that was a lie and that New York never demanded or directed at any nursing home except a COVID positive patient. The Department of Justice, however, is now supposedly looking into this issue. Can you explain what really happened? What a really uh, it's almost such a brutal question. I can't repeat it on the air. Cuomo smirked because he's a douche. And said, what a shock, the Department of Justice sent a letter a few days before an election. Uh, Just all politics, guys. He then said, they have played politics on this one from day one, right? As he said in his dumb voice, they have done a terrible job on COVID from day one, and they want a counter defense. Well, what they were saying was a lot of people died in nursing homes in Democratic states. It's not just New York. It's all the Democratic states. That's a lie. There's five of them that did what he did. Only one, only New York, prevented Uh, the uh, nursing homes from testing the patients when they came in. So even if you're making them come in, you wouldn't even be aware that they had COVID because they wouldn't allow the testing to happen because of discrimination. Anyway, he says, um, look, the truth is a lot of people did die in nursing homes in Democratic states. The truth is that people are dying in nursing homes in Republican states. It's not it's just that Democratic states had the disease worse and earlier. If you look at how many people died in nursing homes, New York is 46 out of 50. He's apparently revised. He was saying 34th for a while. Now he's saying 46 out of 50. He knows this with 100% certainty. It's his fault this is happening. What he is doing is not counting the majority of the deaths in nursing homes because people who were about to die in the nursing home got into a freaking ambulance and went to the hospital and died there. And he's not counting any of them. Every other state of the 50 is counting those as nursing home deaths. He's not. Because he's a liar and he's among the worst people in our society. That is why this is occurring. He is going on the view and not one of these dunces on the view has any information about what actually happened. So they can't follow up on this. They just believe him because they want to so badly. They want to believe that he's good and Donald Trump is bad. Well, Cuomo tried that approach as well. He had to go after Donald Trump and blame literally every death. Every death on Donald Trump. Watch. I'm holding you know who responsible you know for who. every death in this country. First country. will be because he lied about he lied. it. He lied, he lied about, lied about, it. about it. From day one, they had that memo in January from a person named Peter Navarro oh, that said that? millions are going to die. Mm-hmm. Peter Navarro, they lied about it. Mm-hmm. And they knew that millions were going to get effect, infected and that hundreds of thousands were going to die. Oh, okay. That's the first reason. Uh, the old book says, don't lie, right? Uh, second, <laughs> it's uh, almost a church they service. were totally incompetent in what they did. He keeps talking about the China virus, China virus, China virus, and trying to demonize China. Oh, my God. The virus did not come <laughs> here from guy. China. The virus came <sighs> here did. from Europe. Because he wasn't paying attention and the virus left China, That's what happened. He wasn't went to Europe. Mm-hmm. January, February, March, we had three million people coming mm-hmm. in from Europe, Italy, France, Spain. Mm-hmm. That's where the virus came from. <laughs> and he never knew that. And he never said it. Uh, no, this is he a this is it. all on his doorstep. All of it. All of it is on his door. So I like how we have at the bottom, Andrew Cuomo is awful.com throughout the entire clip. That makes me happy. So much in there. First of all, they lied because Peter Navarro had wrote a memo about it. Who's Peter Navarro? He's a trade economist. What the hell does Peter Navarro know about? The, he's not an epidemiologist. Because they had a memo that Peter Navarro wrote that people would die. First of all, we knew people were dying. That's why it was a story. We also had watched as people started dying in northern Italy. We all saw that happen. We knew it was a dangerous virus. It wasn't that he didn't know or lie about that. Beyond all of this, did Andrew Cuomo not have access to the news those months? Did he not know that New York was a travel hub from Europe? Maybe he could have applied some resources to his own freaking state. And did you know that uh, the old book, which I think is the Bible. The old book says, don't lie, as Andrew Cuomo says. All this man does is lie. He is a literal human factory of lying. 
All he does all the time is lie. And no one ever asks him a difficult question. And when they do, he rambles on with nonsense like that. What the hell does it matter if it came from Europe? Where did Europe get it? They got it from China. Where did, I don't know, Arizona get their virus? They got it from New York. Should we blame New York? Should we blame Andrew Cuomo for it? Of course, the answer to that probably is yes, isn't it? Back in a second. Do you know the average American has 97 points they could add to their credit score, but have no idea how to get those points? ScoreMaster is the new credit science that super boosts your credit score. The average ScoreMaster user raises their credit score 61 points in 20 days or less. Say your credit score was in the high 500s to mid 600s when you bought that new car. If you got a ScoreMaster first, raise your credit score first, just the average 61 points our listeners get, you could have saved nine grand on that car loan. Pretty impressive. How about for a home? I mean, if you did the same thing with a home, just the average 61 points, you could have saved 100 grand over the life of that loan. ScoreMaster puts you in control of your finances, not the banks. You can enroll in minutes and see almost immediately how many plus points ScoreMaster can add to your credit score. Visit scoremaster.com slash stew, scoremaster.com slash stew. The slash stew part of the address is important because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Scoremaster.com slash stew is the place to go. Scoremaster.com slash stew. So Michael Moore is saying that Donald Trump is going to win again. He uh, said that back in 2016. He said, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, he said in 2016, four or five months before the election, I said Trump's going to win and he's going to win by winning Mich- Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. That got me no free entrances to casinos, by the way. It hasn't done me any good, but now they expect me to know what happens next. And I, of course, none of us know, but I wake up every morning with the assumption that Trump believes he's going to win. And that is good enough for me. If he thinks he's going to win, then I think he's going to win. Uh, he did call this last time and he does, you know, he's had a connection to that uh, particular area of the country, obviously, for a long time. Um, is he right? Well, one of the reasons, there's a couple ways that Trump can win this thing. Number one, Donald Trump is a unique individual that just breaks polling. He's just going to create polling errors because of who he is and how he operates. Possible. Number two, there's a unique polling error that comes from this coronavirus era era with all the mail-in voting and all the stuff we don't fully understand yet. One of those two things could happen. We'll see if Michael Moore is right in just four days. Back in a second. Time to talk about Not Free America, new book uh, that is out now. It's by Mike Donovan. He's been fighting tyranny for years as founder of the nation's largest pro bono civil rights law firm. Uh, our Bill of Rights has been long, long under attack. This is before COVID. This is before George Floyd. I mean, it goes back a really long time. If you watch The Blaze, you know that. Uh, if you refuse to kind of surrender your liberty to the government, to really anybody here on Earth, You need this book. Uh, Not Free America solves the issue uh, of citizens being used by the government. And it's more than just a book. It's a solution. It's a pathway to try to find our way out of all of this. Uh, That's what Mike's going for here. And uh, if you want to go to notfreeamerica.com, you could take their liberty pledge and order your copy today. You can find out how to stop the overreaching abuse of our government and what actions you can do to make all this better. Do your part. Visit NotFreeAmerica.com. Learn more about the book and check it out. See if you are are looking at this thing the same way. I think a lot of you will be. NotFreeAmerica.com. NotFreeAmerica.com. Order your book today. One of the reasons I love you so is because you guys are like soldiers in in our little army, and you do such a great job helping to spread the word of the show. Got the New York Post column up. I'd love for you to share it. They don't have access to their account. They can't retweet it. If you would, it's at uh, Stu Does America on Twitter. Also, review the show on iTunes. It helps us spread the word. We will see you on Monday, a day before the election. Ah!